Welcome to Sexology, a podcast that untangles the science of sex and pleasure. And now, with this week's episode, your host, clinical psychologist, Dr. Nazanin Moali. Hello there. Welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Nazanin Moali. First, I wanted to thank you for listening to this show. I got many positive feedback and emails and reviews on iTunes. And I want to say thank you. It means a lot to me that you're listening and you're finding this show helpful. And please, please feel free to give me a, a send me an email, visit my website, leave a comment if you have a topic that you want us to talk more about. You can find my information at sexologypodcast.com. Today, we're going to talk about the topic that is challenging for many people. I often hear it from my clients and also from my friends. They just talk about their tendency to make like similar, the same self-limiting, self-destructive choices in their relationships. And they're talking about how they tend to repeat the same unhealthy behaviors. Then they talk about how it ruined their last relationship or they found it unhelpful and they want to change it, but they don't know how to or where this, where these kind of behaviors and patterns are coming from. If you know someone that's struggling with that, this is a great episode in order for them to develop some understanding around that issue and struggle. In today's show, we're going to talk about what is a fantasy bound and how to identify and overcome this struggle. It's my absolute pleasure to have my guest today to introduce her. Her name is Dr. Lisa Firestone. She's a director of research and education at the Glendon Associate and senior editor for the mental health website, psychalive.org. Dr. Firestone has been involved in clinical training and applied research in the areas of suicide and violence. In collaboration with Dr. Robert Firestone, their studies resulted in the publication of several assessments, including Firestone Assessment of Self-Destructive Thoughts and the Firestone Assessment of Violent Thoughts. Dr. Firestone is a national and international presenter on the topic of suicide and violence, as well as couple relationship and parenting. She's a clinical psychologist in private practice in Santa Barbara and consultant on the management of high-risk clients. Without further ado, here's my conversation with Dr. Lisa Firestone. Welcome to another episode of Sexology Podcast. As I mentioned during the introduction, our guest today is Dr. Lisa Firestone. Dr. Firestone is the Director of Research and Education at the Glendon Associate and Senior Editor for Mental Health Website, psychalive.org. Dr. Firestone, welcome to our show. Oh, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. And uh, one of the books that you authored, many books, but one of them that I, it's one of my personal favorite is Sex and Love and Intimate Relationships. And I know that you co-authored that with your father and Joyce Catlett. And one thing which was fascinating about this book was the different approach about the like a development of sexual struggles for people. I know that many people that I work with, many of my colleagues, they look at the sexual struggles, sexual dysfunctions more through a medical model. But I know your approach is more psychodynamic. Yes, it's much more psychologically focused. We're looking at what developmentally happens to people in their growing up and how that affects them in terms of their sexuality. Which is very important. And one of the things it was fascinating to read about was the concept of the fantasy bond. For our listeners, can you talk a little bit about what is a fantasy bond? Okay, the fantasy bond is a concept developed by my father, Dr. Robert Firestone. And it's really the idea that we have this tendency to want to merge with others, to connect in a way where we lose a sense of our identity. Now, originally, we form fantasy bonds or illusion of connections with our parents because we want to feel safe or early caretakers. But when we get into romantic relationships, we often form a illusion of connection with our partner. And when we do, the problem is that we then lose the attraction and the sexuality dies out. Partly because in this illusion that we're one, 
we no longer have attraction to the other person. They become like our right arm. The problem is if they walk away, we feel like, oh, I can't live. I lost my right arm. But there's also the problem that in that losing our identities or giving up our separate identities, we can't have a feeling of attraction to something that's a part of us. So it's, it really uh, interferes a lot in the sexual relationship. Fascinating. And I know one thing was like you were talking in the book, I know it was mentioned that it's a kind of a defense mechanism. So I'm just kind of curious, are most people experience a fantasy bond or when it's a, like a disruption in the like primary care relationship, that's something that's get formed? Right. I think that that usually exists to some degree, but it does depend on how much pain and and, uh, frustration there was in in your early life. Now, there's no perfect parents, so there's always going to be some. Um, Even a parent that's walking away from the baby to go get a bottle to try to feed them can be experienced as abandoning at that moment in time. And it's not, you know, in, in that situation, the child may fantasize that the mother is still there. They may suck their thumb to still feel soothed like they're getting the food. And in that, they take in the parent and themselves. They start being the parent and the child all in one. And they both try to soothe themselves and are also uh, negative or hostile or punishing toward themselves in the way they were treated early in their life. And then we get into romantic relationships and we often, first of all, choose partners who resemble in some way emotionally, particularly our parents, our early caretakers, who treat us in that same way. So the defenses or the adaptations we made to deal with our early environment still work because this person is now the same. So if we felt intruded on by a parent, we may choose an intrusive partner. And then our strategy of pulling back from them seems adaptive. Or if we had a parent that was unavailable or that we had to you know, always be going after, we may choose somebody who's also unavailable in relationships and we keep going after them still trying to get that thing we couldn't get from our parents. And that is a replication of the fantasy bond. So this original defense that we formed to soothe ourselves at times of distress, and again, that we rely on in proportion to how much we were deprived, then gets put into our adult romantic relationships. And we either choose a partner who's going to treat us the way we were treated, or sometimes we take the role of our parent and we treat our partner the way we are treated. If all else fails, we do do it to ourselves, though. And I love how, like, you know, the incorporation of the dynamic perspective on that and how I I often get clients, they talk about the exact same thing that you mentioned that, you know, I don't know why I keep repeating the same relationships. And I I hate that characteristic, but I end up with a partner that has that or they wind up curious, they're kind of curious, as you mentioned, whether they kind of like creating it in that in their relationship. And it's like to them, they say, you know, the sexual attraction is only there if the person has this kind of a kind of maybe sometimes maladaptive behavior and they don't necessarily can get attracted to someone else that's not that they don't have that. So how can people kind of experience like true healthy sexuality with a partner, but they're not kind of acting out in acting their past? Right. So we do have this kind of radar out for those people who are going to fit that characteristic from our past. Um, It's never what people think they're looking for in a relationship. You know, if you ask them, they always say all these good qualities, but they do notice their patterns after a while. And if you look at your pattern, um, it tells you a lot. And sometimes what you have to do is date outside your comfort zone. You have to choose partners who don't fit that mold. And originally they won't seem as exciting to you. They won't have that amazing spark at the beginning, like fireworks, you know, but actually these are what you can build into the best relationships possible and where the sexuality can be more of a real give and take with more equality, which is actually in the long run, the most satisfying to people. So you can have a lot of passion at the beginning, but if you don't have connection, if you don't have an intensity where you're really drawn to that person and you don't have a sexual spark, the relationship won't last. Yes. And I think that one of the thing that people talk about is like how they feel kind of trapped by their like childhood experiences and how they it kind of caused them to form cer- certain kind of like sexual preferences around like the behaviors and they kind of get like rigid about what is it to uh, what does it mean to have a good sexual uh, kind of intimate relationship so based on your experience uh what are some of the what are some of the childhood experiences that impact can impact our sexuality Sure. I mean, there's a number of things that impact it. One is the way our parents interacted with each other and what is our model for intimacy. 
Were they affectionate? Were they warm to one another? Did they treat each other respectfully? Those things are going to influence us. And then there's how our parent interacted with us particularly our primary caretaker, whoever that was. And it could be a parent, it could be a grandparent, it could be a nanny. I mean, it could be a lot of people. But, you know, was that an emotionally, did that person provide us with secure attachment, which involves making us feel safe, making us feel seen for who we really are, and making us feel soothed when we're distressed. And, you know, those things will influence how we relate in our closest relationships and it'll influence who we're sexually attracted to. So I think that's really important. But when you said that people feel like they are stuck in that pattern, the thing I would say about that is that the thing that frees us from our childhood, it turns out, is feeling the full pain of it and making sense of it. If we just try to put the past in the past and pretend like it's not going to affect us in the future, it's going to keep reoccurring. We're going to keep reliving the old hurts. What we really need to do is to kind of dive in and figure out what did happen And what are my feelings about that? And making sense of that, because this comes from research in attachment theory that is really interesting that for people who've made a coherent story about their childhood, they've made sense out of it, um, then they're free to be better parents, better romantic partners. The problem is that we get stuck in it when we haven't really figured it out and felt the full pain of it. And it's that fact that led me to develop an e-course with Dr. Dan Siegel that we offer on our website, Psych Alive, on how to create a coherent narrative about your past, how to bring up all the unresolved issues so that you can address them and really work through them so you don't have to repeat them in your future relationships. Fascinating. As you said, like kind of getting some insight and awareness is a very important place for people to kind of start from. And I know sometimes it can be confusing for some of the my clients and I know some of my friends that to kind of identify what are some of the signs that you are kind of like reacting in the fantasy bond kind of mode versus you are kind of reacting in the kind of true connecting in a true kind of authentic way. Right. So we uh, actually look at a contrast between an ideal relationship and a fantasy bond in an ideal relationship. Uh, you're open, you share with the person, you're each expanding your world. So uh, instead of not seeing these friends because your partner doesn't like them and not him not doing this activity because you don't like it, you're trying on each other's friends, you're trying on each other's activities, you're expanding your worlds, you're open to new experiences. One thing that happens in relationships is often once they get going, we stop sharing activities. Um, Like we did at the beginning, our lives are busy, maybe we have children, you know, all kinds of things going on. But if there isn't that open sharing experience, relationships die, they don't grow. So in an ideal relationship, there's that openness, whereas in a fantasy bond, it tends to be closed. There tend to be a lot of routines. This is what we do on Saturday night. This is how we do it. Even in the sexuality, this is what we do, when we do it, how we do it. And it's very rigid. It's not an easy give and take that's spontaneous and fresh. Also, in an ideal relationship, people are honest with each other. They see each other for who they really are with their faults and their weaknesses, and they are open and honest with that person. In a fantasy bond, there's a lot of deception, a lot of duplicity, a lot of mixed messages. I love you, but I have no time to spend with you. I want to be close to you as you're turning away from the person. That's crazy making. It actually messes with the person's reality. Also, There tends to be in a fantasy bond an idealization of the person. Either you put them up on a pedestal and they're going to save you and protect you, or you denigrate them and see them as less than you. Um, You're not seeing them as a whole person with all of their good and their bad. Also, in an ideal relationship, the sexuality is personal. There's a real exchange. Uh, Both people, eyes open sex, if you will, people are really making contact during the sex act. Whereas in a fantasy bond, there tends to be either a lot of fantasy where neither person's really present or where it's become very mechanical is a word that people often say. It's become, you know, just this mechanical thing that we do and we're not really, either of us, really there. The other thing is that in an ideal relationship, people ask for what they want and need from each other directly. In a fantasy bond, there's a lot of manipulation. And we often think of it as the person with the loudest voice, uh, as the person who has control in the relationship. But it can be the person who is more passive-aggressive or plays on their weakness, who you know, cries and falls apart every time their partner says certain things that may have a lot of the control. But there's not, like I said, that equal give and take where we're two adults talking to one another and being able to have exchanges. That's what we would see in an ideal relationship. 
And one thing that's interesting, you were talking about, like, you know, people connecting, like uh, eyes open, kind of sex, kind of be really authentic and present during the uh, sexual act. And it's about the give and take, as you mentioned. And something that I often kind of experience with my clients, they're talking about how they need that, like, fantasy in their head to get, like, you know, aroused. It's just an integral part of, like, their sexual experience and they mentioned that and we talked about like you know with few of them that how they can be present and kind of focus on what's attractive in the moment and they lose interest so what are some of the your recommendation about how can people kind of like slowly transition from like being in a this self-sufficient kind of organism during the sex that kind of like preoccupied with the thoughts to someone who is kind of having it, like ha- having a sexual relationship in a like true meaningful way with another human being. Right. I, I think a big part of the issue involved is is vulnerability. I think when you're sort of in fantasy and in, in essence giving yourself pleasure and the other person is just kind of an object that's being used for that fantasy, you don't have to really be vulnerable or open and letting the other person give something to you. So I think that's really where people struggle. And if things that you received early on in terms of love and care from others came with strings attached or led to painful and and difficult experiences, you may have a lot of fear around being open and vulnerable with your partner to really be in the moment, to really feel what's going on in your body and really know that that's coming from another person. Um, So I think it really has to do again with exploring these issues from our past and dealing with those fears. And I think it's important to do that in a slow and kindly manner toward yourself. The idea here is not to be, oh my gosh, I'm a bad person because I'm not doing this right. That doesn't help at all. And what does help is having self-compassion, being kind to yourself rather than judging yourself, not getting over-identified with the thoughts and feelings you're experiencing, like the fears or the negative thoughts about yourself or your partner. And also realizing that there is going to be struggle um, and that that's just part of the human condition. And that doesn't make you different from other people. It makes you like other people. And I think if you have a self-compassionate attitude, you can be a support to yourself as you're going through what may be a very scary process of trying to move away from fantasy and more towards relating in a real interaction with another person. But there's a lot of fear. And I think we need to respect that and be kind, you know, non-judgmental and kind toward ourselves. Absolutely. And I know that you talked about self-compassion and it kind of reminded me of that, like your writings and the materials on negative critical voice, because I see sometimes with some people, the challenge is that they don't want to be vulnerable because they feel if they show their true self, no one would accept them. And they have this intense shame, which comes from this like horrible critical voice that they have. And I work with some some my, some of my clients that struggle with eating disorders, so I can see that the voice is really strong around body. So what what are some of the things that people can do to kind of address that, please? Right. So our critical inner voice is kind of a secondary line of defense that supports the fantasy bond, and it tells us negative things about ourselves. It also tells us that we should soothe ourselves and protect ourselves from others and tells us negative things about our partner. So it affects us in our sexuality in many ways. First of all, there's the criticisms of our body and how we look. So we shouldn't really expose ourselves to our partner. Somehow we're supposed to have sex, but they're not supposed to see our body um, because there's something wrong with us. And And if you keep yourself hidden in that way, then you really keep believing that there's something wrong with you. It's only by taking the brave and anxiety filled chance of really sharing yourself with somebody do you get to learn that maybe they're not going to have that reaction to you and often people's ideas about their body are quite distorted and quite negative Um, so that's an important piece um, is the critical thoughts we have about our bodies then there's feeling like well we're not going to be desirable enough we're not sexy enough or whatever that means we're not alluring enough And then we also, you know, can be critical of our partner or they're just clumsy or, you know, they don't really know how to make me feel good or, you know, whatever it might be. And those negative thoughts also interfere with the process. And then there's negative thoughts, people. So these thoughts keep you even out of the bedroom. Then there's the thoughts while people are being sexual, they often get so in their heads that they're no longer present. It's almost like they're grading their performance like it was an Olympic event (laughs) Um, or their partner's performance, you know. Um, So true. But either way, they're not being present or having a real interaction. 
And then there's also a whole set of critical inner voices that can come afterwards. Like, oh, was that really good for the other person? How do they feel about it? Uh, now they're going to reject me. Um, I shouldn't have given in to them or I shouldn't have done that or I shouldn't have exposed that part of myself. You know, all these negative thoughts and the real way to challenge them is to be able to talk about them with our partner. And that's very hard and anxiety provoking, but we can do that. We also have a therapy that we've developed called voice therapy to help people to express these negative thoughts in the second person to start to separate from them, from their more realistic, self-compassionate point of view. Also, to start to understand where these thoughts come from in their past, and then to really stand up for themselves and take their own side against these negative thoughts, and then to really start to take actions that go against the way the negative thoughts are telling them. So an interesting example, we were doing a voice therapy training, and one of the therapists who came between when he came for the level one training and the level two training, uh, he had this realization about his relationship with his wife, which had been an almost 30-year marriage, that often after they would... Uh, make love, he would have the thought, she doesn't really like being with you. She's just doing this for you. She doesn't like it. And he just thought that was true. But between the two trainings, he decided to at least challenge it. And when they were still in bed after they had made love, he said to her, you know, I often think that when we make love, you don't really like it. And she just was shocked. And she was so genuinely shocked that he realized that this was not her thought. It was something he was projecting onto her, and he had spent all this time feeling bad about himself when it wasn't the way his wife felt at all, and they really got to talk about it when he got to have a different view of himself, and so, you know, it can be huge how we carry around these views, and we just assume that we know how the other person feels when we may have no idea. Yeah, absolutely. And it seems like I'm glad that his partner was open <sighs> and was willing to kind of engage because sometimes I know couples they have their own struggles. So when like one partner kind of show up in an authentic way, the other person might not be able to hear it and respond in a loving way, which can kind of like makes the cycle worse. Right. One thing that helps a lot with that is if the partners are, are exposing themselves. He was saying something about himself. He wasn't saying, you make me feel <laughs> right. uh, bad about our sexuality. When partners share things with their partner in that way, you're for sure going to close your partner down. If you could stick with what I want and not what I don't want, people love to express to their partner what they don't want. I don't want you to do this and I don't want you to treat me like that. What they have a much harder time is asking in a vulnerable way for what they do want. But if they can do that, they almost always get a warm and loving response from their partner. When a conflict is going on with a couple, you know, one person can unilaterally disarm and it takes all the wind out of the argument. And they can do that not by giving in or saying I'm wrong, but just by saying something like, I'd rather be close to you than have this argument right now, and maybe reaching out and being physically affectionate to their partner. You can disarm your partner or melt their heart by looking at your part in these things, not by saying, you make me feel this way, but here's what I want, you know, and that's a very different, it's going to get a very different response from your partner. Yeah, absolutely. And I like that kind of focus on I statement, kind of identifying your feeling versus on kind of saying you made me feel this way, which is fantastic. And I love that you added the kind of adding the reassurance, like the touching and kind of getting closer to your partner as another way of kind of like securing the relationship in a way. I'm kind of curious about the voice therapy. I haven't heard about it. Is it similar to narrative therapy or it's different? Yeah, it's different than because... It's, a, it's sort of an integration um, of different therapies in a way. We would have people verbalize their negative thoughts for themselves, but instead of saying, I'm no good, or I'm unattractive, no men like me, or there's, you know, or people have voices about other people too, like there's no good women out there, they all reject you. We get a lot of those comments on Psych Alive. You know, and the reality is, if you put it in the second person, a number of interesting things happen. First of all, it separates it from a more realistic, compassionate point of view toward yourself. It also brings up the emotion behind these thoughts. These are not just a cognitive process. It's a very emotional process. Often there's a lot of anger and rage against the self, a lot of suspicion and fear of other people that comes out. And it's really interesting. Often as people get into it, they reveal a lot about what they learn a lot about the depth and degree of their negative thinking toward themselves. Um, and there's a lot of pain and sadness, too. And we encourage people to express it with a full feeling. 
So this is an emotionally focused therapy, but we start with the cognitions. Interesting. In most emotionally focused therapy, they start with the feelings, but they get to the cognitions, you know, give words to those tears. It's the same thing we're getting at. Um, and I think you need both those pieces. You need to understand what people are telling themselves, these critical inner voices, but you need to know what the feeling is behind these voices. Because also when after people have expressed all this negative emotion toward themselves, there's a feeling naturally of wanting to stand up for themselves. And that's the adaptive emotion coming out. And then they answer back and say what's a more realistic or compassionate point of view about themselves and about their partner. And they also start to understand where these thoughts come from. Now, the reason for that isn't because we want to blame parents, but we want people to get compassion for themselves. These thoughts didn't come from nowhere. They're not a bad person for having their thoughts. These are just thoughts. They're not dangerous to anyone as long as they're just thoughts. It's only when we act them out in behavior that they hurt other people. And then we really want people to challenge their actual behavior. So in that way, I say it's a cognitive affective behavioral therapy. It's cognitive because we're talking about the thoughts. It's affective because we really want to get into the emotion. And it's behavioral because we also want people to challenge these negative thoughts and go against the behaviors they're instructing them to do. So if they're telling you to protect yourself from your partner and not act that excited about them, we want people to go against that and really express their real feelings. If they're saying nobody's ever going to be attracted to you, so you're never even looking at other people, you just look down all the time, you know, and then you wonder why you don't get in a relationship. Or if they're telling you cynical things about others, you know, there are no good men out there, or there's no good women or whatever it is you're looking for. And those thoughts also keep people from really investing or giving relationships a try. And so the actions to go against are first going to make them anxious because initially these thoughts get louder, almost like a parent yelling at them to get back into line. But then, you know, it's really about sticking with the behavior, going through that anxiety and then feeling like you have more room to operate. You can have a wider array of choices in your life and you can really go for the things you want. And that would make you feel fulfilled in your life. That is so interesting. And I think the opposite action piece of it can be so challenging because I can imagine there would be lots of resistance and anxiety through that. So I would imagine like the therapist needs to be really reassuring or do kind of like some kind of support the clients through that. Right. And maybe do some practice visualizations and maybe warn them about the anxiety and try to relabel the anxiety as a good sign that you're moving forward instead of as a negative, because there's no positive behavioral change without anxiety. That just doesn't happen. We also want people to do it in small enough steps that they don't get overwhelmed with the anxiety. So take it slow. It's not that you have to change everything about yourself tomorrow, which is often what people want to do when they realize something they don't like. It's just be in a compassionate way, make small steps in that direction. And when you get off course, just get back on the wagon, not, you know, beat yourself up for it. Right. And I really enjoy your focus and emphasis on um, self-compassion, because I feel that people think, oh, if I'm like keeping this critical voice, it helps me to move forward in life. And this is like motivating me. But that's I'm, from what I'm hearing, it seems like it's really getting in the way of people thriving. Right. And it's interesting because people do have that thought, you know, oh, you know what? You're telling me I should just be uh, reward myself all the time or indulge myself or not challenge myself and grow. And we're saying, no, not at all. It's just that beating yourself up doesn't make you a good person. It just doesn't. It makes you less available. It makes you um, in a bad and cynical mood toward yourself and others. And what you really want to do is be more compassionate toward yourself and toward other people. But often we treat our friends and the people we like a lot better than we treat ourselves. So the idea here is to treat yourself like you would treat a good friend. So true. So I've noticed like we reached end of our program, but I wanted to, I know many of our clients probably would love to get in touch with you or learn more about the wonderful different treatments and also the trainings you have, what would be the best way for them to contact you? They can contact me personally. I'm at L Firestone at Glendon, G-L-E-N-D-O-N.org. But also to go to our website, Psych Alive. We have lots of good materials. We have e-courses on creating an ideal relationship. That one I talked about, about dealing with your attachment history. All of those things can be really helpful to people. And there's also, we have lots of video experts of great experts in the field that are on our YouTube channel. So I, I really think going to the Psych Alive website, or if you're a therapist and want to get voice therapy training, you probably want to go to our glendon.org website as well. 
Thank you so much for those information. I'll make sure I put it in the show notes. And I personally want to check out the <laughs> voice therapy now. So thank you for mentioning that. Oh, you're welcome. It's been really nice fun talking to you about this. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. I hope my conversation with Dr. Lisa Firestone provided you with some insight on how your unconscious forces that are potentially impacting your sexual enjoyment, the way that you relate to your partner, and how you're experiencing your sexuality. You know, I find it absolutely normal for people to try different sexual behaviors, different sexual acts, and partners. So there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're finding that you keep repeating the same patterns, especially if they're not working for you, I think it's important to think about where it is coming from. Am I enacting something from my past? Is there anything in my past that I can address that and would help me to move forward in my future? As always, I'm super grateful for you guys to listening to this show and I would love to hear your feedback and thoughts. And I'll talk to you next week. Thanks for listening to Sexology Podcast. For more great content, visit www.sexologypodcast.com. Please be advised that information presented on this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health provider.